if you need uh, the lesson sheet for tonight, there are plenty at the Welcome Center. It has tonight's date on the front of it. They look similar, but it has tonight's date on the front of it. Or they're available <clears throat> on the Connect page online as well. Either one. But hopefully you have that and you're ready for this evening. As we open in prayer tonight, we want to pray for uh, some of our teens that are at teen camp this week. They are just now, sometime, I would say in the next five to ten minutes, be finishing up their evening service. They have an early service on Wednesday nights, and then they have skits and a number of different things. Their theme this year is Lumberjacks, and Philip took the teens to camp. And so he has been drafted into a lumberjack competition. And uh, if you have seen Philip uh, recently, you see that that would be fitting. I think, I don't think he knows this yet, but I think he might end up in one of the skits. Tonight I have some um, privileged information that says he might end up in a skit, whether he knows it or not. Um, but uh, they've been doing a good job with the teens. And I'll share a little bit over the next few weeks with you about uh, the direction of some of that, and God's been working in Philip's heart over the last uh, year and a half about transitioning into, into mainly church ministry. We kind of tried to give him a little bit of space and room as he tried to <clears throat> figure out what it was that God wanted him to do, and uh, they have uh, taken kind of full reins with the teens the last few weeks, and I'm excited about where God's leading with that. Uh, but uh, if you would, pray for our teenagers that are there. Pray for Philip and Becca. They have all four of their kids there. Um, but I think, that, I think that they're having a good week so far. But let's pray for them as we get started. Lord, thank you for <clears throat> your grace in our lives, and uh, we thank you for those <clears throat> that are gathered around us this evening that we can call brothers and sisters, uh, family members in you. And um, it is uh, you that are our strongest tie between one another as a church and the gospel that saves and redeems us. We ask that you would guide and direct us tonight as we open your word again in the book of Proverbs and seek out your wisdom <clears throat> for each and every aspect of our lives. And bless our teenagers tonight, the ones that are there at the wilds, and pray that you'd give them a good time this week. They're a little more than halfway finished with their week, and it's good to already hear of what God is doing in some of their lives and uh, the special preaching services, the time that they have with friends, but uh, we pray that it'd be a week that they would come back remembering their growth and what it is that you choose to do in us, in them, and through them. I ask that you bless Phil and Becca as they have them there and then they travel home later this weekend. Help us tonight to honor you and to glorify you, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I think he did pretty good for being by himself tonight. You give him a trumpet in the other hand and tambourine on his leg, and you give him a one man band tonight. Turn, if you would, in your Bible to Proverbs, and we're going to be there in just a moment. You can, well, you can start in chapter 10. Um, this is going to be one of those Proverbs studies where we're in a bunch of different passages tonight. We've had a few during our study of Proverbs where we mainly stayed in one section of verses, five, ten verses, mostly at the beginning of Proverbs, and then we've had a few where we're skipping around to a number of places. Tonight is going to be one of those uh, where we are in a number of different spots because the topic that we're going to address tonight is addressed all throughout the book of Proverbs, and so we're going to be ready to skip around here in just a minute. Proverbs chapter 10. In fact, let's just go ahead and uh, begin in Proverbs 10, and, or uh, 10 and 12, uh, and we'll start there in just a second. Let me open with an illustration, and I'm going to put a picture on the screen, and then we're going to read a, a passage, not from Proverbs, I'm going to put it on the screen, it's from James. The book of James is actually very proverbial in, in how it feels. If you study the book of James, it has Solomon-type feel to its writing, uh, and it's all, it moves from one topic to the next fairly quickly, ties them together, but the book of James kind of mirrors some of the portions of Proverbs, and this is one of those topics tonight. I'll put a screen, uh, picture on the screen. This is a, just a cool picture more than anything else. Um, there's a bomb of some type exploding in the background. 
they're not actually trying to hit that ship. If they did, someone would be in trouble. That ship is actually brand new. Uh, they're testing it, and there's a number of different ways that they test it. They drop different types of bombs near it to see how the electrical systems and the radar systems respond to it to see what the pressure does and uh, buoyancy, all sorts of different things. This particular ship, uh, this is the USS Gerald Ford. Um, I got, I, some of you have probably seen this ship and not realized it. It was built in Norfolk there at the shipyards. In fact, you've probably seen it for quite a while. Um, right after Joy and I got married, they started um, construction on this particular ship in Norfolk in 2009. Uh, it has not been deployed yet. That shows you the length of time it has taken for them to build this ship. This particular ship cost somewhere in the ballpark of $13 billion, uh, depending on how you number crunch it. There's uh, about eight or nine million that's gone in, uh, eight or nine billion that's gone into the construction, another four billion that's gone into research. The man that started initially trying to plan it out, it's a whole different type of carrier, aircraft carrier than the U.S. had ever used. It's sort of the, the, the new design. We hadn't had a new design in 40 years before this. The man that started working on, uh, his team started working on the design, started around 1999 working on it. So you're talking like Clinton administration, and it is going on its first deployment this fall. Uh, so you can imagine. Now, to build this type of ship, they, they want it to last, you know, 100 years in service or longer, depending on uh, what kind of fortune it finds. But I, I put a few facts there in your sheet and it says that it was christened in 2013. Talking about feeling, if a boat had feelings, it would feel like it's underachieving. It was christened in 2013 and nine years later, it's going to go on its first deployment. It was kind of uh, dropped out into active duty in 2017, but not full active duty. Mainly, they've just been doing testing, required testing on it in the last three to four years, and it is finally ready to go. Here's some facts about it. It's 1,106 feet long. It weighs about 200 million pounds. It stands at its tallest point there at the radar, 250 feet tall. It has 25 different decks. It includes two nuclear power reactors. It has a flight deck. Uh, usable flight decks of about six and a half acres and when it's at full capacity it's going to house feed and provide for a crew of 5,500 people and ready to do that for months at a time without fully docking and you know, I want you to think about this this massive feat of engineering the part of the ship that that propels it and steers it makes up less than uh, less than a full tenth of a percent <laughs> of the entire body size of the vehicle. You see there, 0.09% of the entire size is made up of its rudder and its propeller system. Now, the rudders are not anything to be scoffed at. They are uh, welded, or they are poured steel, a special type of steel, weigh about 100,000 pounds. But in comparison to the size of the ship, uh, they are actually relatively very, very small. And we're going to put this familiar verse on the screen for you. I think this is... Uh, now, James, when he was writing this, probably wasn't thinking USS Ford. He's probably thinking the boat that he and Peter were in when they were fishing. And even that big 20, 30, 40, 50-foot boat that he was used to was steered by a very small rudder. And here is what James says, Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. That just means wherever he wills it to go, he steers it by this very small little rudder. And what is he talking about? He says, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So here's the comparison that he's using. You have this massive, powerful ship. And I, I don't have a diagram of it. For some reason, the United States Navy is very stingy with detailed, putting detailed plans of their aircraft carrier online. I cannot figure out why they don't want us to know all about it, but they don't. And so I wanted to show you a little picture of just the rudder portion, but it is very tiny in comparison to the full big might and power of this ship that affects 
thousands of lives and that is going to be used for the protection and safety of our country in a number of ways. And it's steered by two very relatively, relatively very small pieces of metal in perspective. In the same way, our lives impact a lot of things. They touch a lot of places. We have a lot of details of our lives. And yet our mouth, it's not just talking about the actual like lips, tongue, and palate of your mouth. He's talking about our words. And he's saying the way that you use your mouth and the way that you use your words can steer the whole of your life and others. It can bring peace and direction, or it can destroy and bring wrath. And so we're going to look tonight at this relatively small part of the body, but has a big impact, specifically the power of our words. And so if you would, look at Proverbs chapter number 12 to begin. And here's three main ideas or points that I think that uh, Proverbs kind of gives to us, that we can use our words to harm we can use our words to help, and we can use our words to hide at times or to deceive ourselves and others. And so let's start with this one. Number one, using our words to harm. It's going to feel like we got shot out of the gate into a sprint tonight because of the number of verses that we're going to just sort of roll through. But again, hopefully, like the last few lessons of Proverbs, we'll take these and kind of use them as a study or meditation throughout uh, the week as we can. Proverbs chapter 12, look at verse number 18. <clears throat> How can we use our words to harm others? Notice it says, There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Now, think about that again. There is a tongue, kind of phrase it this way, there is a tongue, there's a person that when they speak, it's like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings, is, is or brings health. There are times that we can be reckless, is, is sort of what it's picturing here. There's, there's a way in which we can use our words in which it's like a sword. And when we interact, now a sword is cool in battle. A, a, a three or four foot long, big, shiny sword. Imagine what you want, medieval sword, samurai sword with a sharp razor edged blade. It's really cool on display on your wall. It's really neat when you're in battle and you're fighting with it with its purpose. It's not so neat when you pack into your car on a family road trip for thousands of miles and you're just trying to avoid it the entire way and not get cut. It's not something you pull out at a dinner party or at a kid's party when you're playing Twister. You don't run through the inflatables with a sword. Why? Because whether it means to or not, it can poke, it can cut, it can impale, and it can destroy. And the Bible says that when we use our words recklessly, in other words, when we use our words not considering the consequence, it can be destructive. It says, but the one that's wise with his words, the tongue of the wise, he actually does the opposite. It brings healing. It brings health to people. But there's two different ways. There's reckless words, which are when we don't consider the consequence. But then notice the kind of the second misuse of words. There's unguarded words, and those are when we just don't care. And we, sh and we know the difference, right? There's words where we don't, we don't think about the consequence, we just blurt it out. Where we're caught up in emotion. Maybe there's passion. Maybe we're just not thinking. We haven't paid attention to who's around in the room. When you ever mention something in jest, um, sarcastic, maybe about a very serious topic, you, you didn't mean to speak light of it, you just used it as an illustration. Uh, maybe you, you've spoken about death... I'm going to I'll use this illustration. Um, I, uh, there, I don't want to give away too much. Okay, I would say it this way. I, I was with someone in conversation not too long ago in which the person referenced their work, and they were talking about how difficult their work was at the moment, and they said, I'm killing myself trying to do all of these things. Well, what they did not consider was that the person sitting with us had a brother who had committed suicide. And that person did not mean to cause harm. They didn't mean to, but they were a little reckless with their words. They just didn't consider that. But there is a different way in which we use our words in which not, it's not that we don't consider it, it's just that we just don't care. And that is when we're not just caught up in the moment. That is when we're angry. We're actually thinking about it. We're trying to cause harm in an unguarded way. Look at Romans chapter 18, verse number 13. 
And there's a reason we should be careful as Christians about either one of those. Using our words without considering the consequence. Because, why? Because of the effect of the gospel in our lives. How am I going to minister the gospel to someone when I'm careless with my words? But then notice the next unguarded words. Chapter 8, sorry, Proverbs 18, verse number 13. <clears throat> Did I say the wrong thing, didn't I? Proverbs 18, verse 13. I'll give you a second as we get there. There's some times where we speak without listening and without understanding. Proverbs 18, look at verse 13. He that answereth a matter, notice it says, before he heareth it, it is folly, foolishness, if you remember that word from last week, and it is shame unto him. When we speak without fully understanding or even trying to understand, have you ever inserted your opinion about something before ever hearing what it is? Have you ever argued with someone's opinion? You know their opinion. You know what they think. It could be a personal conviction. It could be a choice. It could be whatever. And you know what theirs is, but you just either blurt it out, and we will use both ways, verbal words, typed words, sometimes uncommunicated uh, words, but in just how we, our body language can perceive those things. All of those things fall within this communication this evening that we're talking about. But there's an unguardedness sometimes where we seek to argue with somebody or we try to get our point across with no interest in ever hearing their side of the story or their opinion of things. I've even done this, done this with spiritual things. I believe this, or I say this, and we kind of scourge people that don't think the same way. Scourge people that maybe even have a strong conviction in a different way from the Holy Spirit and from the Lord, having no interest ever in finding out how they came to that conclusion. We just want to stab and pierce and think that somehow that will be effective. I'll be powerful in my words. I won't give them a chance to intervene. I don't want them to be able to say what they want to say. Rather than going to them and say, hey, look, I feel this way. You feel this way. I'd love to know how you came by your conclusion. I'd love to know how you came to that decision. Because I don't think that you're trying to be evil in your decision but I'd like to know how you came to that. But rather, like a sword, like Proverbs 12 says, we run up and think that it might be effective to stab someone in the gut with our words and then run away and say, I don't want to argue. I just want to stab you and then I'm, going to, I'm just going to leave you alone. I'm, I'll let you deal with that wound and when it's done and it's healed, you'll thank me later. The Bible doesn't teach that that is effective at all. In fact, it teaches quite the opposite. Sometimes we're reckless with our words, unguarded with our words, you see others there, we speak false words, divisive words. We won't go in that one tonight. We mentioned it a few weeks ago as an abomination when someone sows discord. I'm going to drop this here, let you not allow you to enter into conversation with about it, but just know that we disagree and then I'm just going to leave. And then there's misleading words. But notice, this is an interesting one, one in which I know that sometimes there are times that I fall. And if you listen to me preach, you think maybe I fall into this quite often. Look at Proverbs chapter 9, 10, verse 19. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. <clears throat> and that's when we speak too many words. Sometimes we speak too often. Sometimes we speak with too little thought. And there's times where we just speak too much. And when that's the case, it's inevitable we're going to say things we shouldn't say. You say, well, I, that's kind of, you know, it's just your opinion. Maybe you don't like to. There's times where I don't like to talk at all. There's other times like this where I may ramble on forever, but notice what Proverbs 10, verse 19 says. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Somewhere that there's just a lot of words being spoken, here's what the Bible says. There's going to come a time where, where sin comes in. Because we're sinful human beings, not fully sanctified in the presence of our Lord yet. And so he says, if there's sinful human beings that are just talking and talking and talking, you can know for sure that eventually sin is going to be inserted into that. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. So in other words, he's saying, guard what you say. Don't be reckless with what you say. And there's times where you don't need to say it. And it's interesting that the Bible points this misuse of words out. Well, what's the consequence of it? Notice, that's the second thing that we really want to look at. What's the consequence of misusing our words? Well, we're just going to pick out two of them tonight. There's a number. You can divide relationships and you can destroy 
your worship. James chapter 3, verse 6 says this, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Notice it uses fire a lot, and it's like, just when you think it's not a big deal, he goes a little stronger language, a little stronger language, a little stronger language, to the place that he says, some of us, our mouths have the effect and devastation of hell itself when we communicate with others. How would we like that to be said of our words? Well, how could that be said of our words? Notice Proverbs chapter 16. If you're still in Proverbs chapter 16, look at verse 28. Proverbs 16, <clears throat> verse number 28 says in verse 28, a froward man, it means contrary, somebody that's just always again. Have you ever been in a room with somebody that, somebody brings something up and they say the opposite, and then they're in a different room, and somebody brings up the very point that they made over here, but they say the opposite over here. It's like, they're just going to take the opposite no matter what. But then notice the end of the verse, and a whisperer, that is a word that was very commonly used for a gossip. A gossip separateth chief friends best even the best of friends a gossip can destroy their relationship with others and they can destroy others relationships with each other by how they speak blaze pascal famous scientist he said it this way in one of his writings i lay it as a fact that if all men knew what others say of them there would not be four friends in the world left <laughs> it may be the truth and we laugh but it is sad William Edward Norris, uh, English poet, he said this, he says, and it's, it's helpful, he says, if your lips would keep from, this is kind of a, a way to teach child, children to be careful with how they speak, but I think it will help us as adults. If your lips would keep from slips five things observe with care to whom you speak, of whom you speak, and how and when and where. Now, I want to notice those five things. This is not, I'm not quoting this like it's a scripture verse, but you can find all these principles in scripture. He says, here's how you need to be careful and think about your words. Who are you speaking to? Now, typically in our lives, if the person we are speaking to has nothing to do with the circumstance or the person or the event or the situation or the matter of which we are speaking, it's probably not this person that we should be speaking to. To whom are you speaking? How will you affect their lives? Are they a Christian? Are they not a Christian? It will affect in how we speak to them. What is the goal and purpose of our conversation? To whom are you speaking? Of whom are you speaking? And both should put up flags in our minds. I'm speaking to this person. I'm speaking of this person. They're not here. And I know how this person feels about this person. I'm trying to either stoke a fire that they already don't like them, or they like them, but I think that they want, I want them to like me more. So I'm going to put this person out. To whom, of whom, how are you saying it? <laughs> uh, I mean, text messaging has been a great invention of mankind because uh, there's times where in three and a half seconds I can know what I need to know and what's going on and I just move on my life. That could have taken three and a half minute conversation if somebody had to call me. But there's other parts of text messaging that are not so great. Like when you text something, I've texted Joy before and she thought, I was upset at someone or upset at her or offended. I was like, I thought I was happy when I sent this. I'm not, I don't use a lot of emojis. I need to probably learn to do that. I don't use a lot of smiley faces or uh, angry faces or anything, but maybe I should start doing that to like, at the end of my sentence, happy. This is the way I feel. This is what I'm saying. Um, I just don't do it. And so sometimes it's confusing. And you know, you can say something and how it is said can communicate the opposite of what it is that you're saying. I can tell my kids, I'm so happy with you right now. And that communicates something very different than, wow, this is awesome. I'm so happy with you guys today. Two totally different things, but almost the exact same words. So to whom, of whom, how, when are you saying it? Because there are times to say things and there are times not to say things. One of the most disappointing things is when Christians interact in a negative way with each other about somebody else or about another Christian in front of someone that is lost. Or a Christian tries to handle a disagreement or a situation or a problem or an argument, but there is a time and a place. And then 
Notice the last one. And where are you when you're saying it? I want you to think about this. You can drastically affect someone's life with who you're speaking to, who you're speaking about, how, when, and where you are speaking. I'll give you a couple of illustrations, and don't think too hard about this. They haven't been relatively recent. I don't even think that I was pastor when one or two of these were happening. Maybe. I don't know. I know I wasn't pastor when one of them happened. I, I, there are people that have visit our church and never come back because of words that were communicated to them while they were here. There was somebody that was visiting our church. It's been a while. Uh, a lady who was visiting our church, single mother who was visiting our church and um, was dealing with her child. And the child was having a rough day. And what they did not know about that child, that child had some very severe emotional and even mental health issues. And the mother was trying her best to be patient with the child. The child was kind of creating a scene and a fit in the back and everything. So service ended. Mom is talking to somebody in the auditorium. She's visiting. She's trying to get to know people in our church. It's been great. She goes back to retrieve her child from the nursery. A couple people in the foyer think said lady is gone. And they proceed to begin speaking about her and about her child. And said lady is in the door of the nursery. And here's everything that is said. Obviously, she never returned. And the people that were there talking still, I think to this day, have no idea how much they crushed the spirit of this person because they didn't say the right thing. They weren't talking to the right person. They weren't doing it in the right place. And it definitely wasn't the right time. And I don't, I don't know to this day. I don't know where that lady and her child are. Another person came to visit our church Actually, I think it was just a couple months after that. And uh, another lady, couple came, visited our church, and uh, went home, visited for a couple weeks, and we started not seeing them again. And so we went to follow up and check, hey, how are you doing? How can we help you? I said, I'm not coming back there. Well, why? We went through a long conversation, proceeded to find out that someone in the church had gone home, and it's not just always your verbal words, it's where and how you say it, had gone home and posted something online uh, after a conversation they had had with this person, a very specific conversation, posted their opinion that they had had a conversation with somebody who disagreed and then proceeded to sort of just rip the person's opposite opinion. I'm not sure why, but at some point over the next seven to eight days, the person from our church that had a conversation with this person friended them online. <laughs> and immediately the person just started scrolling through their timeline and Lo and behold, came across the person's post about them. Now, I didn't name names, but here they are finding that to their face, this church member was so nice, so happy. We want you to come be a part of our church. But online was nasty and vehement and, and completely opinionated to the place that obviously this family doesn't attend here either. Now, I don't say that to throw any particular person under the bus. I don't have a particular person in mind. The situation is gone, and uh, it's been several years. But I use those illustrations to say who, when, where, and how you speak is important. I want you to think about this. James chapter 3 verse 2 says this, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Now, is there one among us that can actually do this and be a complete whole man and never speak? No. So it also teaches we have to be patient with other people's words because there is not one among us who all of their words are perfect at all times, said in the right way, to the right person, at the right time, and in the right place. But we do have a goal. Notice Luke chapter 4. This is speaking of Jesus. Jesus goes home. He's preaching in Nazareth. He gets up one day and goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he opens a book and he begins to read and he reads out of the Bible and he's teaching them and here's what they said of him and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Wouldn't that be a great testimony of the children and family of Jesus if their words could say anything could be said? He said they wondered, they were amazed at how kind and gracious he spoke. Have you ever met someone in the, just the way that they spoke was so kind and so gracious and so interested and, uh, and just overall had the Spirit of Christ that it affected, it impacted them. 
Do you notice it says there's certain things that don't need to be said, certain people they don't need to be said to, and there are certain times when saying them, think about that, certain times when saying them could bring harm. So we must be patient, must be careful. I like this quote by William George Plunkett. Say, so who is he? I do not know. Uh, he wrote this, though. Three things never come back. The spent arrow, the spoken word, and the lost opportunity. Notice uh, also the destruction of praise that you have above it. Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verses 29 through 32. I'll read verses 30 and 31. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. We don't want to do that, right? We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't want to cause harm for the Holy Spirit in our lives. Grieving the Holy Spirit means we're shutting it down. We're sinning. We're living in a way in which it is not impossible but difficult. We are, making, we are resisting God's work in our lives. How do we do that? Because we definitely don't want to let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And interesting, most of those there are referring to words in our mouth. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Oh, I don't want to do that. How would I do that? With what you say and how you communicate. And then it goes on and says, but be kind one to another. Notice uh, James chapter 3, verse 9. Therewith bless we God. This is a great verse, interesting verse. James is sort of, this is his tongue chapter, his word chapter, chapter 3, and here's sort of how he starts to conclude it. Therewith, the mouth, with the mouth, we bless God, even the Father, and with the same mouth, therewith, we curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. He says, you see what he's saying? With, with our mouth, we stand in church and praise the Lord. And with the same exact mouth, we put down others. We speak ill. We seek to do harm, to stab like a sword, to jab and to pierce. And not to go into too much detail, but I am sure that you have probably had this conversation. If your dog kisses you on the face, that is fine. But I'm sure that we have all heard the conversation between a mother or a grandmother, typically is how this goes. Dog licks child on the face. Mom says to child, don't let him lick you on the face. Do you know where else that tongue has been? <laughs> We've all heard that conversation. And here, James is giving us sort of a similar comparison. You're saying one thing with your mouth, but then you're also saying other things with your mouth. And notice how he says, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Notice, if you would, that it can destroy our praise. Now, let's look at the second thing. <clears throat> using words to help. <coughs> using words to help. Proverbs chapter 10. Hopefully you're still around Proverbs. Look at Proverbs chapter 10. Look at verse number 11. You say, well, we're turning a lot tonight. That is a sign that the Bible has a lot to say about this topic. Proverbs 10, verse 11. You say, we've been in Proverbs 10. You're right. Down in verses 18 and 19. But here he is in verse 11. The mouth of the righteous man is a well of life, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. Notice he says violence comes out of an evil person's mouth, but a righteous, a holy, uh, the, the, the righteous man, what does it do? It's a well of life. It brings life to people. If we were to interview the last hundred people you talked to, some, some of you say, a hundred people? I mean, I talk to a hundred people, I'd have to go back to like 2008. <laughs> to, to count all 100 people I've talked to. Others of us, we talk to 100 people in a three, four days at work or however it may be. But let's just say we interviewed the last 100 people you spoke to. Would they be able to describe your words that they bring healing, that they felt life? Maybe if they are unsaved, they don't even understand why, but they sense the Spirit of God living in you by how you speak. That should be our goal. A few pages over, chapter 25, verse 11 and 12. Proverbs 25, verses 11 and 12. Notice how it speaks about our words. So it seems like the Bible's down on words, right? From the first point. It's a fire of hell. It, it's destructive. It's a sword that pierces. It cuts people. It wounds them. So like, we should just not talk, basically. should be. But notice what it says. It could be a well of life. Or verses 11 and 12 of chapter 25. A word rightly, fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. It's sort of giving an artistic setting. 
as an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. Notice it says not just a reprover, but wise. How they say it, how they speak it. It's not that we should never correct, we should never teach, and there's no room for reproof, but it is that it is done in the Christ-like spirit which the Bible asks of us. Notice some of the things that points out that we can do with our words, what words are helpful. Speak honestly. Uh, we'll just pick a couple of each of these verses. The closest one where we are, chapter 24, look at verse 26. Probably on the same, maybe even on the same page where we just were. Every man shall kiss his lips that giveth a right answer. The word right there just means true, honest. It says when someone speaks truth, it's like giving a kiss. Now, for some of us that are uncomfortable with other people, we may never want to speak truth again. But it's a picture. It's an allegory. It's saying it is like a, te- it's a tenderness to it. It's a loving example when we live out this way. We should speak thoughtfully. Notice that these are sort of the opposite of what we said would hurt. Lying lips would hurt. That's an abomination to the Lord. Uh, reckless words are, are hurtful. Look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28. Proverbs 15, verse 28. This is a point in the message where we hear fewer pages turning as we get a little further. We're, all, we're getting there. Proverbs 15, verse 28. Notice, it says, The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. Notice that phrase again. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. A person that is righteous, that follows God, typically, this is not said of a wise, prudent Christian that speaks his words in a Christ-like manner, is not typically someone who says, I just speak my mind whenever it comes. Whenever I just, it comes to mind, I just say it. That's typically not the description. You say, well, you're offended by what I say. I just, I just say it like it is. It's how you say it like it is that is destroying everything. Notice, again, verse 28. The heart of the righteous, he studieth the answer. But notice, but the mouth of the wicked, what does it do? It just, it just pours it. It just spits it out. just pours it out. just lets it all fall. And there's other, again, we're not going to go through every verse, but there's others that you can pay attention to here. Proverbs uh, chapter 17, verse 28. <clears throat> notice. It says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. There's a... Mark Twain quote similar to this, but it says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shuddereth his lips, meaning just flaps them, is esteemed, uh, or, excuse me, shuddereth, it means he does not flap them, it means he shutteth them. His lips is esteemed, um, he is esteemed as a man of understanding. But contrast it to, again, Proverbs ten nineteen that we read a moment ago, where there's a lot of words there ends up being sin and foolishness. So we speak less and more thoughtfully, speak calmly, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 15. You're probably still right there around there. I'm trying to keep us in the same couple chapters. It says, By long forbearing, a prince is, uh, is a prince persuaded. And a soft, notice this phrase, a soft tongue breaketh the bone. What does he mean there? A, a calm answer. He's talking about a prince being persuaded to bring judgment on something, to make a decision, to give someone something, divide, to, trying to bring the, the man of authority to a, a place of decision. It says forbearance sometimes. <laughs> Holding back your words is the best way to accomplish something sometimes, to allow someone to think. Then he goes further and he says a soft tongue breaks a bone. What does it mean? A calm answer under control is far more powerful and effective. You have Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It says, think about this in, in what we love about our Lord. Romans 2, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness or the forbearance and long suffering? Notice this. Not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. If God's mercy and his grace and his kindness, knowledge of his wrath and what he could bring is effective in bringing us to salvation too. But if that is all that there is, it doesn't. But he says here, the goodness, the forbearance, the loving kindness of God moves us to repent. Then it, gonna, it will be the same with our words. When we are kind, when we are calm, when we forbear, when we are loving, it is still bring people, bring others to the same decisions. And then finally, speak discerningly. 
Proverbs, we'll get, to, we'll get to this first in a second, but speak discerningly. Proverbs 15, verse, or you're still there in 25. Look at verse 11. Or, excuse me, we already read that one. 15, verse 23. 15, verse 23. Speak discerningly. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season. How good it is! Exclamation point. When it is discerning, when we think about, when we pay attention. Proverbs 16, 1 says, The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Are we wise with our mouth? And last thing, we'll close as we get to this. Proverbs 16, 20, 26, 18. As a man, man who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is a man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith not, Am I in support? Uh, notice <clears throat> number three, using words to hide. And there's two points here that are going to seem kind of opposite. We know what the Bible teaches all over it. Matthew chapter 15, when Jesus is speaking, he says, Out of the heart, man proceeds, the truth out of, comes out of man's heart by his mouth. And what he says, Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 11, says, He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. Here's what the Lord says in Luke 6, 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Now this makes sense to us, that what comes out of our mouth is often what is rooted in our hearts. And how are we going to help people with our words? And how are we going to cause beauty and kindness and calmness and love from one person to another? How are we going to impact someone's life when it's not what is in our hearts? It's impossible. But there's actually this twofold truth to this because we are wicked enough to get that. We understand that Jesus is teaching your words can reveal your heart when they're spoken in truth and authenticity. And because we've figured that out, here's something we've learned to do. We've learned to speak what is not in our heart. Now, eventually, it does feel like, eventually, out of our heart, our words eventually spill. Usually in a moment of anger, bitterness, grief, sadness. In those hot water moments of life, it extracts or pulls out what's in the tea bag of our heart and can't stop it. It's just revealed. But there are moments in life where we use our words to hide what's really going on inside. Proverbs chapter 14, look at verse 23. Proverbs 14, verse number 23. says, In all labor there is profit, but the talk of lips tendeth only to penury. It means literally po poverty. It leads to nothing. Here's what he says. Labor and getting things done gets things done. There's profit in it. But he says just speaking it doesn't actually accomplish it. If you talk about the job, I'm not saying this in an accusatory manner, but if you start a boat in the Clinton administration and you deploy the boat 24 years later, and I'm not saying that they should have rushed it, but there has been some talking going on in the last 24 years that this boat has been being built. And eventually you're like, you just, you just got to do it. Like you just got to put it together, work it, send it out, or it's no good. And he says the same is true of our, we can say spiritual things. We can say stuff that sounds godlike. We can say things that are churchy. But until there's legs to it and until it becomes action of our lives, our words don't mean anything. Proverbs 26, verse 23. Proverbs 26, verse 23. <clears throat> Burning lips... And a wicked heart, like a potsherd covered with silver dross. You say, what's a potsherd? I'm just going to let your mind wander on that. As nasty as you can imagine, that's what you're, you're right. What, what you're thinking is what this is describing. So he says, a mouth that talks a lot but has a wicked heart is like a port john cast in gold. There's no purpose to it. First Timothy chapter Four, verse 12, let no man despise your youth, but be thou an example of the believers, Timothy. Be an example of what Christ is doing in your life. How are you going to do that? First thing, in word, in what you say, and how you say it, who you're saying it to. How are we going to, 
let's conclude. How are we going to do this? We use our words to, are we using our words to hurt others and our own lives? The, the testimony of Christ. Do we use our words to help others? Because there's a difference between just not speaking so you don't hurt and speaking so you help. But then also, do we speak to hide? We say the right thing. We do the right thing at church or we say the right thing in front of the right people, but we know that what's inside doesn't match. Well, how can we do that? Here's a great prayer for us tonight. You say, I don't know where to start with my words. This is a great place to start for the next few days. We can pray this. Lord, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lips. We'll close with this illustration in uh, Pilgrim's Progress. I've teased the last few weeks that there's a lot of literature I'll Google and don't read. I actually like to read Pilgrim's Progress, and this is an interesting part of the book. In Pilgrim's Progress, Faithful is having a conversation with a man named Talkative, who at first seems to convince Faithful that he has a real spiritual interest. He just talks to, Talkative just talks to anybody and everybody. He can talk literally to anybody about anything. When it's spiritual, he's spiritual. When it's physical, he's physical. When it's evil, he's evil. And then his friend Christian comes and gives him good advice and reveals the deeper problem with talkative. Here's how he describes him. Uh, he's, Faithful says, he's a good man. Actually, he says, he's a very pretty man. That's how he describes him. And here's his description. Well, that is to them that have not a thorough acquaintance with him, for he is best abroad. Near home, he's ugly enough. If you're saying that he's a pretty man, and it brings to mind what I've, I've observed in the work of the painter, whose picture shows best at a distance, but very near is more unpleasing. Religion has no place in his heart or house or conversation. All he has lies in his tongue, and his religion is to make a noise therewith. It's a dangerous thing when we master the use of words to hide the absence of a real relationship with Christ. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you for your word to us about our words. And we ask that you guide and direct. Maybe not be hypocritical, just saying the right things, but knowing our hearts are far from you. Um, a pretty picture at a distance, but quite disheveled when close up. We know we won't find perfection in this life, but we do ask you for continued sanctification of our hearts and our souls. And we pray that you'd help us in this area of words, for it is by them that people generally will get to know us, whether they see what we say on a screen or over a phone conversation, a text, an email, written letter, however we communicate. May we do it always with the mind of Christ, so that it can be said of us that people wondered, people were amazed and astonished, but more than that, that people were pointed to you by how gracious and kind wise, um, instructive our words are in, in how we handle it, how we speak. And we pray that you do it for your glory and for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to take a look on the back. We're going to finish with four or five minutes here in, in, in time of prayer. If we have enough time tonight, it would be great to split into some groups, some men in, in one section. If there's men near you praying together, ladies together, some of our college career, young people that are near each other can pray together tonight and uh, share a request with each other. And uh, as we say to the toddlers, use your words to communicate to each other what it is that God's laid on your heart to pray about tonight. You see several that have been on our prayer list for a few weeks there at the top and continue to pray for uh, them. Uh, John Dorsey Sr., uh, this is John and Melissa's, Melissa Tigner's dad, um, he's in a home for Alzheimer's care, um, not far from here, and we're glad the Lord worked that out. There was a lot that the Lord did to work that out for them, but uh, he is in hospice care as well, so we're praying for their family and then for him, uh, God's grace. Our campers at the Wilds, um, a number of good things have already happened this week. Um, Philip texted me, I've been, I told Philip, I said, just text me anytime if you got questions. I said, I've been, I've been to the Wilds every year since I was 10 years old. And at some point this year, I'll have to try to slide down so I don't break my streak. But um, so he said, what do you do when a camper does not bring a towel? <laughs> I said, have fun. <laughs> but they got him one out of Lost and Found. I don't know if it had been washed or not, but they got him one. Uh, but other than that, they've had a great week so far. We're praying for them. And then uh, you see there at the bottom, Tom Moore's having surgery August 16th, praying for that. Members traveling, number of members traveling. 
Uh, we pray for Edmonds. Mrs. Edmonds has COVID right now, and so we're praying for them. And we've had a couple other families that have had that as well. Now, I'd like you to pray for this event that we're hosting August the 19th. You have there at the top uh, some ways that uh, you can help with that. Uh, but we're really just praying it will be an encouragement to people that come. There's a pastor's uh, fellowship meal where some people have been invited in to speak and inform uh, particularly to pastors about some different issues and how things affect churches. And that's from four to six. We'll need some help at that uh, serving. And then there's a choir. You don't have to be a member of our choir, but there's a choir if you want to just come sing with people from all over the state and you have the time there. Also need some help with nursery and some parking help. But more than anything, we're just praying that we as a church would be a blessing to the people that come and that it would be an encouragement to us as well. So if you would, as you pray, uh, begin to pray over that particular event. Let's take the next four or five minutes and uh, split up into groups and uh, find somebody there near you. If they look more tired than you feel, then you can be the one to go get up and, and go to them. And then we'll close in prayer in just a minute.